and then gonna, gonna let people in now. Okay, aloha everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, we're gonna get started in about two minutes. Uh, we're gonna wait to see if we have uh, any more people slowly trickling in um, and then we're gonna get started. Thank you. Hello. Aloha. Aloha, everybody. It's TJ. How are you? Aloha, TJ. Hello. Hey, Sean. How are you? Hi, Lauren. Hey, Lauren. You know uh, the gate by Kunia Road, uh, the military gate before you go down the hill? Is that part of your district? Sorry, which gate are you talking about? You know, when you're on Kunia Road mm -hmm. uh, and you're passing the last gate for Schofield and you go down where you hit the secure, the secure gate at the bottom of the hill. I think I know what you're talking about. Is that your district? Yes. There's a huge pothole that's like 18 inches across and about six inches deep. I'll send you a picture and an email tomorrow. Sounds good. Perfect, yes, yes. Okay. My son actually almost hit it. <laughs> right on, mahalo. Aloha everyone, um, we're gonna get started. It's 6.32 p.m. Um, and we have over 100 people registered. So to be respectful of everyone's time, we're gonna go get started. Um, but I just wanted to thank you folks for joining us. Uh, tonight's uh, Waialua Sunset Town Hall uh, is being hosted by Senator Gill Riviere, uh, Representative Sean Quinlan, Representative Lauren Matsumoto, and Council Member Heidi Suneyoshi. Um, the focus of tonight's town hall um, is really going to be on uh, the recent flooding uh, events that occurred um, a couple of weeks ago. Um, and we do have a slate of presenters um, who will be providing some uh, valuable information to us all. Um, but before we get to them, I just wanted to share some of our Zoom rules. Um, we ask that if you're if you're not speaking, that you please be on mute, uh, so we don't get any feedback coming from you. Um, if for some reason you can't mute, uh, we're gonna help you by uh, muting you. Um, we're we're also gonna have a question and answer period. Um, and during the question and answer period, uh, we ask that all of your comments, all of your questions, uh, if you can put them in the chat uh, so that we can see them. Um, but we're going to roll right into our presenters. Um, and our first presenter um, is going to be Edwin Matsuda from the Department of Land and Natural Resources. Um, and he's going to be talking about dam safety and flood control. Uh, Edwin, are you on? Yes. OK, the floor is yours. Thank you. Great. Good evening, everybody. My name is Edwin Matsuda with the Department of Land Natural Resources Engineering Division. Um, our section oversees the uh, dam safety program here in the state, and we also uh, oversee the administration of the National Flood Insurance Program. Um, Carol Tialbeam in our section. Uh, it's ill tonight. She won't be able to make it, but um, I can field any questions or I can take some answers back and I mean, some questions back if there are questions that I cannot answer. Uh, but just to give you a brief overview, um, dam safety program, we regulate close to 130 dams statewide, um, primar primarily on the islands of Maui and Kauai. And most of these dams are fairly old. They were in support of the uh, sugarcane and the pineapple plantations back in the 1900s. Um, the majority of the reservoirs on Oahu have been since removed. Um, there are still some that are in existence uh, on Oahu and 
there are quite a few on the North Shore side of the island. Um, they, they tend to um, be in stream reservoirs and the, there's a series that is um, the uh, Wahiwa Reservoir does feed into the Kaukonahoa stream and it does come down towards Otaki Camp, down towards Wailua, by Wailua Town, and then kind of skirts up north towards Haleiwa and joins up with the Opaiola stream. The other series, uh, there are a couple of other series, the Opaiola series and Helen Mono series reservoirs, which do feed down and eventually feed down to Opaiola and, and do um, venture through Haleiwa Town in the stream. Um, these structures during this past event that we had this um, this month were um, uh, on the Opalu series. They did not reach the spillway, so th that means that these structures were filling up. They retained water, but um, water was not being released from these structures. Uh, and I know there was a lot of concern that there was flooding due to these structures, but um, there used to be a series in Opaola. Most of them were, were um, removed by the owner. So there's one large one, Opaola number one. And you can see these structures on our website, dams.hawaii.gov. Uh, so that reservoir, Opaola number one, did not reach spillway. The owner had um, been monitoring it. And so the water did bypass that structure. It's an off stream sh structure. And um, Wahiwa Reservoir was flowing over its spillway. I think it did get up a little beyond two feet in the spillway depth during the peak of the storm event. Um, it, it feeds into the Kaukonahoa stream. So it did not contribute to, it did not contribute directly to the flooding that was being experienced in Haliba town. I know that was a big question and concern that uh, people want to be cleared up, but um, uh, that's pretty much all I had on that. If there's any questions, um, you know, I, I can answer those. Oh, and I, I also did want to say that we do have um, our, our website set up on uh, for this flooding event. Um, it's if you go to waihalana.org. That's w a i h a l a n dot org, you can see um, we have a, a page on the top there for the March flood events, and it has a lot of valuable information on the flood insurance program. Thank you, Ed. Um, and yes, and if you have questions for Ed, um, please put it here in the chat box and we'll get to it uh, during our question and answer period. Uh, up next, uh, we have uh, Roger Babcock. Uh, Mr. Babcock uh, is with the um, City Department of Facility Maintenance. Uh, Roger, the floor is yours. Thank you, and uh, good evening to all the community members. Um, I, you know, want to acknowledge uh, Senator Riviere and uh, Representative Matsumoto, Representative Quinlan, and um, Council Member Suniyoshi. Um, thanks for bringing the community together and uh, it's, it's nice to see so many people. Um, and, and obviously that's because there's, there's a lot of concern. So I can just let you know that, um, uh, although I'm new to the department, um, I can let you know what we do. The Department of Facility Maintenance is, uh, is responsible for maintaining uh, streams that the city owns and, uh, and streams that the city roads cross. Um, but that's only part of what we do. So uh, we have four divisions. One is, uh, is stormwater, which is related to um, stormwater collection system and storm drains and, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, we have automotive and equipment services. So we maintain all the vehicles in the city fleet, uh, including heavy equipment. Um, we have public buildings and electrical maintenance. So that's all the street lights and all the public buildings and, and uh, parking garages. And then we have our division of road maintenance, which is we uh, maintain all the roads and sidewalks and, um, and the streams, so streams is under road maintenance. So anyway, um, although I do have a staff of 600, um, I also have, uh, believe it or not, uh, over 230 uh, vacant unfilled positions. So um, we, um, the city, all city departments are, are 
are uh, surprisingly um, short of, of people. But, um, but anyway, we do have responsibility for maintaining the streams. I want to um, share my screen and show you our website, which uh, hopefully you can see that. Um, this is honolulu.gov slash DFM, which is our department, slash clean stream HTML. Okay, so that's our, uh, where you can get information about the clean stream program and, and kind of what we do. There are a bunch of links there. And if you open some of those links, you can learn about what our standard operating procedures for going into and cleaning streams uh, is the, the rules that we follow. And also our permit that we have that allows us to go in and, and maintain streams. Um, that's a AECE stands for Army Corps of Engineers. So the Army Corps of Engineers controls all waterways, you know, in the United States. And so we have to have a permit in order to enter uh, streams and, and to do maintenance with equipment. Um, and so we do have a permit and you can see that that's our current permit, um, which was issued in 2019 and it's a five-year permit that goes through 2024. Um, and it's very long. Um, there's about 400 pages in there, and and it shows it shows all the streams and what we can do, and wet interval and things like that. So I was going to share with you um, just to give you an idea of what's in there to kind of give you an idea of what we're looking at and what we're responsible for. So this um, one thing shows the listing of the streams. Um, and then it, it has maps and it also has maps of each individual stream. So I'm gonna just scroll down. There's about 16 pages of streams. <clears throat> and then it starts with the maps, which might be interesting. So this is the whole, um, you know, the whole island obviously. And it shows you um, where the, you know, where are, where all the streams, oops, where all the streams are, sorry. Um, and I will try to expand this a little bit. Or, or folks. One of the things I'd point out is that the streams that we have a permit to maintain are only those ones that have the blue around them. Okay. And those green dots up there, we have, we don't maintain the stream. We can't maintain the stream, but we can maintain the sand, the opening at the beach. And we do that. We'll open those when the water get, level gets high. But all the other streams that you see on there, it's all, that's all private property. Or, or state property, federal property, and, and we don't have um, access to those. So let me just show you, if we go down, then, then the maps continue and they show each district um, where the streams are that we have um, uh, access to and we have a permit for. And so you can see like here uh, over in um, uh, Kahlu area, there's, you know, there's a lot of streams there and we have access to you know, four or five of them. Um, and those are the ones that we're sort of committed to um, maintaining. Here's, here's North Shore. So none of these streams um, are, are city property or we're able to maintain them. Uh, and and uh, perhaps, um, let's see, actually, I think North Shore was, yeah, here's North Shore. So, you know, here's North Shore. And you see there's a lot of streams here. Um, but if you focus in, there's just one, there's just one place and that is uh, Haliva Road. Um, and you'll notice that, that we can maintain just right around the bridge. Um, that's, that's all we have access to. It's all, private, pri all privately owned, the rest of the stream. Um, so we maintain underneath the road there and 10 feet on either side. And when I say underneath, um, that, that's maybe not really correct because there's always water in there, so we can't. Um, we don't have boats and things, so we we would pull a crane up with a bucket, um, a bucket, and and block off a lane, and then uh, uh, use a clamshell and grab uh, vegetation from the banks. So ten feet on each side, Malka and Makai of that of the road uh, is what we're able to to maintain. Every, everything else around it and downstream and upstream is all. Um, privately owned. So um, we um, have a, we're in the process now with, um, at, at the request of the city council, we're working with them to develop a, um, a schedule 
um, uh, to, so that we can um, get to all of the streams um, on, a, on a regular basis. And um, that's something that, you know, that, that hasn't happened before. Um, there, there's kind of a lot of history. In the old days, um, stream maintenance was, there was more people and stream maintenance was done um, uh, on a more regular basis. Um, the, um, due to some things that happened, um, the Army Corps of Engineers got wind that we didn't have permits to do any stream cleaning anywhere. And so they, told the city to stop going into all streams until we obtained a permit. And that was in 2010. It took until 2019 to get the permit. So there was a fairly long period where nothing was done at all in any of the streams. And that's unfortunate um, because, you know, then things got pretty overgrown. But we have started doing stream maintenance again now. And we are, um, you know, trying to uh, trying to catch up. Um, and um, but it's um, uh, it, it is a very important um, thing on our on our radar and a very important um, uh, priority for us and for the and for the city. Um, this doesn't just affect uh, your area; it affects many others. Um, I was just on a call. I was on a town hall immediately before this with uh, uh, with folks from Ina Heine that have flooding issues as well, and so um, we we want to. Uh, we want to uh, continue to improve. And um, I think I can uh, stop there and we can uh, let some other folks talk and be happy to answer uh, questions um, from anybody as we go forward. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, and yes, if you have questions for, uh, Roger, uh, please uh, do put them in the chat. I do see that we already have some, um, so we'll get to them uh, during our question and answer segment. Um, up next, we have uh, Hiro Toya, uh, who is the director of the city and county of Honolulu's Department of Emergency Management. Hiro. Thank you, Jacob. And uh, you know, I wanna thank uh, Senator Rivera for inviting us to this forum. And you know, I think there's often a, a gap between the government that we have and the government that people want. And, uh, you know, part of that is uh, within the executive branch, our ability to execute and to, to do things that we're um, supposed to be doing. Um, but the other parts of it is like, you know, we, we all work within the, uh, the legal constraints that we have and with the resources that were allotted. So I um, really appreciate having this forum uh, with the executive branch uh, of the city and county of Honolulu, as well as the state of Hawaii. Um, working with the state legislature and uh, the city council to to um, uh, to talk to you all and to um, tr to really try to be the government that um, you guys want and deserve to have in the community. So really, I um, want to uh, thank you for uh, having me tonight. Um, so Senator had asked me to um, uh, really talk about the um, the alert and warning process and some of the emergency response actions that we take um, here at the city and county of Honolulu. And uh, I'm going to be followed by uh, Administrator Luke Myers from the, uh, the State of Hawaii Emergency Management Agency uh, to talk about um, for things from the state's perspective. So I'll just kind of quickly go over um, what we do in terms of um, uh, alert and warning and uh, how, how that reaches you folks. So, um, of course, um, it's not just uh, the city and county home in the state of Hawaii. It's actually we work with the federal government on a regular basis uh, through the National Weather Service. So um, the National Weather Service is responsible for not only doing the forecast, but um, issuing alerts and products that um, tell people what's going on. So with regard to flooding, um, there's several types of products that they could issue. Um, one is called the flood watch, which is sort of a, hey, be prepared. Um, conditions are favorable to flooding. So everybody pay attention to what's going on. Um, so that was issued um, on March 8th. Um, basically the environmental conditions were uh, kind of ripe for uh, heavy rains. Um, so they gave us a heads up that things might happen. And of course, we did see uh, heavy, heavy rains materialize on Maui. They were heavily impacted on uh, the day before um, we were impacted on Oahu. Um, so that's the flood watch. Um, the, the other product that the Weather Service could issue is called the flood advisory, is when um, they, there's a rain event happening. It could be like nuisance flooding, maybe a little bit of ponding going on, but you know, just drive carefully, nothing really life-threatening, but really pay attention to what's happening. Um, and then the next level up is the flash flood warning. Of course, we uh, went into that um, on March 9th and, and subsequent days. So 
Um, I'll talk a little bit more about each of those things, but um, how you can receive those is, um, of course, uh, our local media is really good about um, rebroadcasting those products uh, to the public, um, whether it's through their actual uh, TV stations, radio stations, or through um, push alerts that they might have for, for their mobile apps. Um, so that's, that's one way. Um, uh, the National Weather Service and NOAA also have these uh, weather radios, um, so you can get the alerts right away through those. Um, now, once things start getting a little bit more intense, um, if, if there's a warning issue, then uh, you might see the, uh, the emergency alert system go off. So that's the crawler that goes on the TV that's accompanied by the tone. It's over the radio as well. Um, if it's really serious, you might have those um, cell phone alerts that go off um, kind of involuntarily. You know, you have your phone on silent, but it makes this really annoying noise that catches your attention. Um, and so there's these things that are happening out there to, to try to notify the public about what's going on. Um, we at the city and county of Honolulu uh, use a program called HNL Info. Um, so that's a mobile application that you can download. It's free of charge. Um, we can also send you text messages or emails if that's your preference. Um, so basically for the uh, flooding events that happened earlier this month, um, we were issuing products, um, uh, not only the city and county, but through all, all those other people um, issuing uh, alert messages to try to, you know, to, to let folks know what's happening. Um, so our first um, uh, flash flood advisory happened at uh, 5.02 a.m. Uh, on uh, March 9th. Um, and the rain escalated um, into the morning and uh, by 8.33 a.m. they were issuing a flash flood warning, primarily impacting the windward side. Um, and I do see the, um, I do see the, uh, the comment and the, um, in the chat. Uh, yes, the, the siren system is another way in order for us to uh, alert folks. Um, but the, uh, the emergency alert, um, wireless emergency alert, that goes to all cell phones regardless of um, who your carrier is, um, where your hometown might be. Um, as long as you're in that geographic area, you would get that alert. Um, so flash flood warning issued at um, about 8.30 in the morning, um, primarily impacting the windward side. And things got pretty bad on the windward side as well, um, to the point where we're actually uh, leaning forward to um, plan for a more complicated search and rescue mission if the need was there. Um, so what we do um, at the city, when we have a uh, flash flood warning issued, we uh, activate our emergency operations center and uh, we bring in representatives from all the first responder agencies, from public works um, departments like Rogers department and from our transportation folks. Um, and that allows us to coordinate our actions a little bit more closely and quickly um, as an emergency escalates. Um, so what we were doing that morning, we activated the EOC shortly after 8.30 when the flash flood warning was issued. And uh, we started um, talking more closely with all the first responder departments and uh, coordinating um, actions uh, that were needed. And uh, just trying to lean forward on how we can um, uh, escalate our response if needed. Um, of course, 911 is still active. So if anybody needs immediate assistance, that's the, the channel through which you get assistance. Um, and we were anticipating that there may be a point in which um, the fire department, uh, it may exceed their capability to do search and rescues if um, flooding became much worse. Um, air rescue wasn't really a great option because of the inclement weather. Um, and there's, um, we have a very limited inventory of um, vehicles with very high clearance. Um, that may be able to go through a little bit higher flood water. So, so Rogers department actually um, activated some of their larger vehicles um, in, in order to potentially support a search and rescue mission. Um, luckily we didn't need to do that. Um, now, of course that was in the morning and as we went into the afternoon, um, we, we, you guys all know what happened. Um, we, from, from our standpoint, um, we got a, a notification from the National Weather Service regarding the uh, the real um, intense rise in the stream levels and uh, at the Opaiwula stream, like um, pretty pretty far into the mountains. And uh, they basically looked at that and compared it to historical values that they had and uh, recognized that this is gonna be a significant flooding event for Haleiwa. Um, so they asked us um, if uh, we would like for them to issue the, the highest level warning for a flash flooding, which is this uh, catastrophic flooding. Um, that resulted in the, uh, the the wireless emergency alert that got sent out, the uh, emergency alert system. Um, and what we also did was recognizing that not everybody uh, would be receiving these alerts that, okay, let's, we need to send the first responders out into the community to notify people as much as we can. And so um, we basically, we, by regulation, we do have uh, evacuation zones defined for uh, 
uh, simulated dam failure events. Um, but what we don't have is defined evacuation zones for uh, flash flood, like riverine flooding events. So what we had to do was to come up with a, a way to basically define an area. Um, we knew that Opaiula stream was the one that was going to be impacted and uh, focused our efforts in that immediate vicinity and uh, sent first responders out to assist with evacuation. So um, we moved as, as quickly as we could. Um, now there may be um, likely room for improvement and I'll acknowledge that. Um, and uh, anytime an incident happens, you know, we, we look for ways to improve so that we can do things better in the future. So of course that, um, that uh, flash flood warning continued until about midnight and uh, flash flood watch continued into, to, into the following week. So basically we um, had heavy rains for the following, almost the entire following week. Um, uh, on Wednesday, we had another flash flood warning that caused the land landslide on uh, Kamehameha Highway. Um, and then the, uh, on Thursday and Friday, um, got a little bit of a break over the weekend. It rained, but it wasn't as intense. Um, and then back again on Monday, another flash flood warning. So, um, so you know, just a, a intense series of rain events, um, and some of which actually delayed the city's ability to quickly respond. But, you know, what happens immediately in the aftermath is that um, we need to figure out the impact. So um, actually, I, I went into Haleiwa with um, Mayor Blangiardi and Governor um, the day after uh, on, on Wednesday. Um, and also, um, we sent uh, um, our damage assessment teams out as quickly as we could. Um, but what we were able to do, um, because of the ongoing inclement weather, what we did was opened up a, uh, a online portal for damage assessment so people could self-report their damages so we can um, kind of understand the impact of the community. So that's happening immediately in the aftermath. Um, we're also working with uh, the Department of Environmental Services and with Roger's department, uh, the facility maintenance. Um, I, I know that um, the debris drop-off was an issue that um, the uh, transfer stations wouldn't, uh, they're, they're, not a, they're not able to take mud and rocks and things like that because their stuff goes to uh, H-Power. So, you know, you can't send a bunch of dirt and rocks to H-Power, but um, we knew that was an issue. So what we had um, uh, Roger's department do was um, basically allow for curbside pickup of dirt and other debris. Um, so environmental services increased their uh, uh, bulky trash pickup and then, uh, accompanying them was uh, Roger's department. Um, they had the equipment and the means to pick up and dispose of dirt and rocks and things like that. So um, I know that probably didn't come as quickly as um, you folks wanted. Um, we, we moved as quick as we could. Um, and again, you know, room for improvement in the future, but uh, we of course operate within the, uh, the authorities that we have and the resources that we have. And um, we, I think there was also a desire for the city to go into, you know, private property to help um, homeowners clean up and things like that. And unfortunately, that's not within our authority or resources to do that. So um, what we can do is pick up stuff from curbside. So um, we asked folks to put uh, their debris and heavy um, uh, bulky trash out into um, uh, onto the curbside. Um, I see the question in there about um, uh, the National Guard. Um, so we to the extent that the, the mission is within the authority of the city and county, we could request for additional um, assistance. But again, going into private property and doing cleanup is not within our authority. So it wouldn't be appropriate for us to ask National Guard to do a mission that isn't within the scope for us to do. Um, so again, you know, this is that gap that I'm talking about with the government that we have and the government that people want. Um, and you know, private property cleanup is always gonna continue to be a challenge for us. Um, so what we do with the damage assessment information is not, we don't just collect the information just for the sake of it. And by the way, what we did was um, collected the information online and uh, uh, compile, uh, we did a, um, what we call a windshield assessment. And so we drove around um, both Haleiwa and the windward side and uh, identified neighborhoods to target for damage assessments. And um, we actually went door to door on every home that we thought there was damage. Um, and, and yeah, we probably missed some, um, but uh, as much as we could, uh, we knocked on doors to talk to residents, um, those who were home to, to get a, a story of their damages so we can document that better. Um, so what, we're do, what we do with that information, um, we first referred that over to uh, Department of Planning and Permitting, who is part of the process, but um, they're gonna be responsible for issuing uh, any kind of repair permits and things like that. Um, uh, also to uh, the budget and fiscal services, the real property tax folks. Um, we're actually trying to get um, real property tax relief for those homes that were impacted. 
Um, we share that information with uh, nonprofits like Red Cross, Salvation Army, and those that are providing assistance. Um, we also do share that with um, the State uh, Department of Human Services, um, uh, the component that runs the SNAP, SNAP program. So any of the uh, actions that um, other state agencies might need to take based on the damages, um, we share the information um, with them so that they can make a better determination. So um, we are currently working with uh, the state to see what kind of federal assistance we might qualify for. Uh, unfortunately, this is not a, a fast process. You know, it does take time for us to work with the uh, different levels of government to, um, to, to get to some kind of uh, conclusion on the level of assistance and type of assistance that we can offer. Um, so the final thing is, you know, if, if for those who need uh, assistance still, uh, of course, like for emergency response, it's 911, but if there's still an ongoing need, um, please call 211. Um, we do work with the, the nonprofits that are uh, referred through that program and share information with them uh, to try to best meet the uh, needs of the community. Okay, and uh, I'll uh, stop there for now. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we'll go over to uh, Luke, uh, who is with um, the State uh, Emergency Management. Luke. Good evening. Uh, my name is uh, Luke Myers. I'm the administrator of the Hawaii Emergency Management Agency. Uh, thank you to the uh, representatives uh, of the state and of the, the city for providing Haima a chance to come and uh, maybe find out some more information from you all. Uh, we believe at the state level, all disasters and emergencies start and end at the local level. Uh, and that, that can be challenging when we have these incidents. Uh, as Hiro pointed out, there's, there's kind of the, uh, the gaps in government services and how the individual uh, may see a response and a recovery. So, so one, at least from the state perspective, I just wanna say um, we are here to support as much as we can. Uh, we're also here to try to potentially identify unmet needs in supporting the county. Uh, state emergency management uh, from for this incident started on March the 7th, as Hero alluded to, we, we had a, a number of store, storm systems forecasted to impact the area. This incident uh, was, a, was a good marker for other incidents in the state of Hawaii when it comes to flooding. Uh, we have a lot of flash flooding in Hawaii and we have drainages that tend to be rather narrow and small. And for those properties, parcels, residents, visitors, and businesses in those areas, flash flooding can come on very fast. We started looking the day before Oahu got impacted uh, on the county of Maui in the Haiku area. They had about 13 inches of rain in 24 hours. And so for that area, uh, Edwin had also brought up uh, some of the dams and reservoir challenges that we have in the state. We had similar issues where uh, an ag dam that actually had been decommissioned uh, filled up very fast, uh, and then it takes a long time for uh, relief downstream or, or, or downriver of those facilities. On Oahu here, as we were activated the day before and uh, kind of leaning forward for this incident, we saw a tremendous amount of rain on Oahu. Again, there was uh, a frontal system that was hung up on the windward side and the north shore of the island. We had other places on Oahu did not receive as much rain, but we had close to 20 inches of rain uh, in the Kolau areas uh, in a 24 hour period. And about 10 inches of that rain fell over a several hours uh, period. Uh, there are some great tools uh, for individuals uh, to see some of this data online and to kind of get an understanding of historically. We, we do have these floods probably every five to 10 years uh, across the various watersheds, but we saw a period from about 2 p.m. when the rain started to about 5.30 of 10 inches of rain. Uh, that's a tremendous amount of rain to come down in a short amount of time uh, and there's really only one place it goes uh, in Hawaii is is through the watersheds uh, and out to sea. Uh, we do understand that the impacts can be uh, devastating to uh, a lot of the individuals in harm's way. Uh, when HERO and them actually put out their alert, we were in a statewide coordination meeting uh, talking about some of the ongoing impacts and we actually had the weather service on the same coordination call. And we were trying to determine how fast rivers were going to rise and at the same time, uh, see what kind of support the city and county may need. So we, 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 we clearly understand that there are risks in these flood hazard areas. 
but with this type of rain soil event, there was so much rain in a short amount of time. And, and at the end, I'm gonna show you a couple of the USGS, uh, US geological uh, pages for stream gauge data and rainfall data, just to kind of show you how pointed the rainfall was. Uh, from a larger coordination perspective, uh, this rain event actually impacted obviously the outer islands and Kauai too. Uh, they had the Hanalei uh, area that was isolated second time in three years over there. One of the things I just want to, I was out with Hero and the mayor and the governor on that second day, we went out a uh, second time uh, with the senator and some others and uh, trying to speak with some of the community members to really understand uh, what type of flooding came through the area. And I just want to commend you all. I, I took my wife and kids up to the North Shore on, on Saturday. There was a ton of traffic. Obviously, we have a lot of visitors back. That, that's good news and other news. But um, I, I just want to commend you all in this area on your sense of resiliency. Uh, we've seen the drone footage. Uh, we had the Civil Air Patrol up several days later. We saw the volume of water that went through the Holly Eva area. And there are obviously some larger hydrologic issues and potential mitigation strategies. Uh, but but your, your sense of resiliency in your community um, as the state emergency manager, I'm thoroughly impressed. Uh, again, Hero called up that, that kind of gap between the response to life safety and then recovery. Recovery is hard. Recovery is, is the time when the media goes away and we, we turn to town hall meetings in this situation virtually um, to really relook at how a community can rebuild and recover. So um, I, I just want to express my, uh, my deep appreciation for the amount of resiliency that, that I've seen in the last couple of weeks on the North Shore. On the, the 22nd, uh, we did get out and do a joint preliminary damage assessment uh, with the city and county and with FEMA. Uh, we looked about 93 properties across the windward side and the north shores of Oahu. And again, as Hiro said, it wasn't all the damage, but um, we tried to get into as many properties as possible. Uh, we also looked at about 25 properties on Maui the following day with FEMA and Maui Emergency Management. That other gap that we have uh, in potential federal disaster assistance can be a long one. In large scale emergencies where it's very evident uh, to the president and to the, the White House, uh, you will see a federally declared disaster done by the president. In this type of scenario and in lots of scenarios with flooding in Hawaii, we don't necessarily meet that kind of first brush, this is a major disaster. So it does take sometime weeks, maybe a month to actually collate all the data, process it um, from my office. It goes to uh, Governor Ige, and then it would be submitted up to FEMA Region 9, which is in California, and then to the White House. Potential disaster assistance after that could be in the form of the individual assistance program, which may be grants uh, up to about $33,000 for uh, a number of impacts uh, for residents. And the other arm of this is small business administration loans for residents for damage to property. Uh, these resources are not meant to um, uh, totally lift you up in your recovery process. Uh, they are to help kind of stabilize and help with some of those immediate needs. Um, so I, I'm here to kind of uh, talk about some of these and share some information. Um, we, we do understand that there's needs in the community uh, we also understand that the, the process does take a while, at least on potential federal disaster assistance. My other main message to you all, especially in these flood hazard areas, we have coastal flood hazard areas with hurricane and with tsunami, um, and we have floodplain areas that are very flashy. I just want to share something here real fast. Let's see if I can do this. screen. So this is one of the, the primary rain gauges that we look at uh, at the state EOC and supporting when we have a rain incident. Uh, and this rain gauge is up here in the central part of the island. Uh, when I worked for the U.S. Geological Survey many years ago, I actually uh, sliced my finger <laughs> uh, measuring stream flow and collection rainfall data. But at this one gauge, which drains down here, uh, the 20 inches of rain, you can see on the graphic up above here, the steepness. This is provisional data from the USGS. They'll get out there and verify this data uh, in the next quarter and validate it. But you can see 
Uh, there were a lot of comments when we went out and did some of the damage and impact assessments and what we've heard in the news of very fast, vigorous flash flooding. And if you, you look at the hydrograph, you look at the graph here on the precip at 2 p.m., it was sitting about 10 inches. Now, up to this point from the 8th, there was 10 inches of rain over two days. So we get 10 inches of rain over two days, you prime the pump. But more importantly, if you look at 2 p.m., 145 to 5 p.m., we had 10 inches of rain in a very small drainage area on the north and windward side. Um, and it just kind of sat there. Uh, the, other, the other graphic I'll just bring up and see if I can do this without. Uh... This is one of the gauges, the river gauges that uh, Edwin had mentioned, a similar type of spike. Um, so this is downstream of that area. You can see at about two, uh, 235, this gauge was um, at about 7.31 feet. And then by the time we get uh, up here, you can see how fast it went up. Um, so that, that kind of primed the pump of 24 hours of rain. And then in a very short amount of time, what was dumped uh, on the windward of the North shores of Oahu uh, caused very high flash flooding. Uh, we, we, would, we would ask you all to really, as we do with any of our hazards, to um, really know and understand the hazards that uh, you are, are faced with. Um, there are a lot of good resources from an alert and warning perspective and from an all hazard preparedness perspective that we, we challenge all of our, our residents and our visitors to know their hazards and to be prepared. If you have any questions for state emergency management, I look forward to being able to answer those tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Luke. Um, up next, uh, we're going to go to Haku Milis, who's the deputy director of the city's Department of Design and Construction. Haku, are you on? Hi, Jacob. Yes, I am on. Uh, thank you for having me and thank you, everybody, for being here. Uh, I'm here uh, as a representative for Department of Design and Construction. Um, hang on, sorry, some technical issues here. Um, I apologize for uh, Director Kozlov. He wanted to be here and share some info, uh, but he's tied up with another one that he was already committed to another town hall. Uh, here to talk about specifically our recommendation to DTS on closing the bridge. Uh, unfortunately, I saw with the news release that, that we put out uh, was more about notifying the public that the bridge was going to be closed and kind of how to get around that, uh, getting access. Uh, so on the technical side, uh, I'll share some information. Um, our bridges, a lot of bridges on Oahu are susceptible to scour, uh, which is basically erosion of the ground that the structural support of the bridge is, is kind of sitting on. And so uh, you have the support of the bridge on both banks. And sometimes you have a, a support pier in the middle or multiple support piers. And how far those posts go into the ground, uh, there's a limit as to how much that ground can erode before that bridge becomes unsafe to travel on. Uh, the same goes for the banks. And so the abutment or the structural portion at the ends of the bridge uh, that the bridge sits on, uh, there is some erosion or scour underneath that area. Um, when it reaches a certain depth, which is kind of dependent on a lot of factors um, specific to that bridge, uh, when it hits that critical scour depth, um, the bridge is no longer safe uh, for vehicles to be crossing over. And so that bridge, uh, because of the heavy rain that we've had, um, the, the speed uh, of the flow going through there, um, we had to make the recommendation for closure. Um, this is a very serious issue and could result in complete failure of a bridge. Uh, in this case, uh, we, we recommended closure of the bridge and we are immediately uh, seeking the help of our consultants uh, and contractor who will be doing the work uh, on that bridge. Um, things do take time and because this, uh, this work, 
uh, a lot of it is is underwater. Um, the one of the critical factors, as I mentioned, is the erosion around a post. And so the post in the middle, uh, there's been so much erosion that uh, it needs to be corrected. And because it's underwater, uh, a lot of the work is underwater. We don't actually know the full extent of the damage to the bridge. Unfortunately, we won't know that until we start the work. And so a number of things have to happen before we physically get out there and do construction. Uh, one of them is bring the consultant uh, under contract, uh, which, which takes some time. Uh, they need to complete a design. And then there are multiple permits that go into um, getting final approval so that we are allowed to do the work. Uh, I won't get into too much technical details, um, but all of those factors contribute to us not knowing exactly how long the bridge will be closed. Um, as soon as we know that, we will definitely share that information. But at this point, any guess that anybody has um, is really a shot in the dark. We really have to get in there, get underwater, and start doing some work to understand how damaged uh, things are. Uh, and, and to be honest, you know, with all of the flood flooding that we've had, um, there are a lot of bridges on Oahu, as I mentioned, that are susceptible to this scour. Uh, and the typical practice after we have a uh, kind of severe event, uh, we go in and do an assessment and check and make sure that it's safe. Um, one of the other bridges that uh, we looked at is the Haleiwa Rainbow Bridge. It has not yet hit the critical depth. Uh, we are working hard to keep that bridge open. And so there will be emergency work um, for both the uh, Wailua uh, Beach Road Bridge and the Haleiwa Rainbow Bridge. Um, the Haleiwa Rainbow Bridge is the same thing where it it's underwater. Um, as you guys see driving over it, it's, it's pretty murky water. Um, there's not a whole lot of information that we can get just by feel. We need to start construction. Um, and as soon as we have an idea of how long it'll be out, we will share it with you guys. Uh, and that's all I have. Uh, happy to take questions. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we're going to sort of shift some gears. Um, we're going to come back uh, to the questions that were asked. Um, but we're going to go to Senator Riviere and Representative Matsumoto, um, who's going to give us a update yep. on the Kavai Hapai airfield. Um, Senator and Rep. Thank you so much, Jacob. Um, and thank you, everyone, for coming tonight. I realize it's been an entire year since we last met for our town hall setting and able to meet in person and talking about the future of Kavai Hapai or Dillingham Airfield and just wanted to give an update on a lot of the actions that we've been taking over this past year. Um, and really, we've had several really encouraging steps that have happened in just the past few months. Um, so I wanted to start with, there have been lots of meetings throughout the year with many different stakeholders and organizations and Department of Transportation and Army. Um, but last month, uh, it was so nice. We all gathered at the airfield and we had elected officials there from every layer of government. We had Congressman Kahele and Lieutenant Governor Josh Green, um, several members from DOT, from the US Army business owners. We had community stakeholders and everybody was there sharing important issues and just thoughts in creating a path forward. Um, and I just wanted to share that we're continuing to um, discuss creative solutions to secure the future of the airfield. Um, and that meeting really was, uh, I feel like a stepping block and forward. It was really inspiring to see what could happen when we all came together to collaboratively talk about a common goal. Um, but I did wanna talk about the two main issues that have there have been a lot of different issues that have come up over the time, but the two main issues that have come up consistently in every meeting is one, obtaining a long-term lease, and two has been the water issues on the airfield. Um, and to many of you here tonight, this isn't, this isn't new, but 
wanted to update. So first we'll start with the lease. Um, the army process is to obtain a long-term lease. First, they have to go through a joint use agreement process that has to go all the way up the ranks and get approved and come back down. And once the joint use agreement is secured, then they can start on the lease process. And it goes through the exact same, um, I shouldn't say steps, but it has to go all the way up and come back down um, in order to get approved. And so currently the army, the DOT and the attorney general in our state are meeting and working towards a 30 to 50 year joint use agreement. So that first part of the step. And so we've been getting updates from them and they are slated to meet every two weeks to work on coming to an agreement. Um, and I'm really hopeful that this will be successful. Um, right before this meeting, I just spoke with Colonel Misigoy, who is the Army Garrison Commander at Schofield um, and to get an update from them and they reported to me that they have given a template um, of a joint use agreement to the Department of Transportation to continue the process of obtaining this long-term lease. And um, so in addition to those meetings, my office has organized um, stakeholder meetings with the area elected officials and community leaders, DOT and Army, in order to collaborate further. And so we are finalizing our next stakeholder meeting for April in order to keep that momentum going and, and all the recent successes that we've had. And so again, I think for a while there was not a lot of progress and just in the past few months, we've really been moving forward. People from all over, from all over the country have been coming together to really work on finding a solution for keeping the airfield going. Um, and next is the water system. And that's um, an ongoing question. And I think one thing that has come out of all of these meetings, we've acknowledged Army is not a water maintenance and expert and neither is DOT. Um, and so we have been exploring the options. Senator Riviere has been exploring, uh, really digging into exploring the options of creating some sort of option, whether it's a public utilities commission or something else. Um, and just in a moment, I'll pass it off to him to give a little more details on this. Um, and I just wanted to mention, I know it's been a really stressful um, and difficult time for everyone, um, especially the tenants. And I wanted to encourage everyone to just stay hopeful and know that we are working as hard as we can. I know my office has been working every single day, day in and day out. I can't tell you how many phone calls I'm on constantly to work on these issues. And I know Senator Riviere, Rep Quinlan and Councilman the member Sunyoshi and their staff have been working really hard on these issues. And I just appreciate, I know there's a lot of people on the call now um, in regards to um, Kavai Hapai. And um, I just wanted to let you know, you know, please don't hesitate to contact my office. Um, I can put my information in the chat, but my phone number is 586. 9490 and my email is repmatsumoto at capital.hawaii.com. Um, and again, I really appreciate your presence here. And if there are any questions um, in regards to Dillingham, Kavai Hapai, um, we will be taking, I think, those questions at the very end after all the presenters and more than happy to answer anything you may have. I know there's there's been a lot of issues, um, and but we've also made a lot of great strides forward. Um, and there's a lot of things to cover in this meeting, but we don't have a lot of time. So I just wanted to kind of hit those main points of lease and water. And with that, I'm gonna pass it off to Senator Riviere to provide a few more details. Hey, thank you, thank you, Lauren. And thanks for everybody for being on here tonight. We tried to put together a really robust uh, discussion. Uh, obviously the flooding is, is, is the primary concern um, of the impact, um, but we did also want to um, take a few minutes to update the airfield. The airfield uh, question is not sitting still. Time is ticking on that. So we thought it would be a, you know very worthwhile to, to bring you up to date. And as uh, Rep Matsumoto mentioned, the, the lease issue appears, there appears to be a fire um, under the DOT to, to try to make it different this time. Uh, the Attorney General has stepped in, the Lieutenant Governor has stepped in. There, and there is a lot of effort and focus going on that. Uh, what is more disconcerting is the DOT's 
uh, kind of dual track where they are sending letters to people saying, hurry up, hurry up and move out. Um, and we can't quite get a straight answer from DOT on that um, question. We are pushing as diligently and forcefully as we can to uh, get a reprieve of the uh, eviction date. So if you had to ask, I, I don't think that eviction date is going to come um, June 30th, but uh, we're still working on that. We're still waiting for the Department of Transportation to make that clear. As uh, Rep mentioned, the, um, the, the lease is a big issue, but also the water system and the management of it. And it's not just the water on the airfield. Camp Erdman depends on the water. The residents along there depend on the water, the city beach park, and the uh, Space Force, the satellite tracking station up a, and a point. Uh, all of those are dependent on the water. So it's not something that they can just turn off and walk away. And with neither the Army nor DOT wanting to be a water company, and rightfully so, um, the DOT has taken it upon themselves over the last decades to basically provide free water for the users I just mentioned. And that can't continue. There's a lot of deferred maintenance, a lot of deferred maintenance. The system is leaking millions of gallons a month. It's a travesty on how much water is being pumped um, to nowhere. So that has to be fixed. That's one of the issues that has to be fixed before DOT could even think about being released. Uh, the Army is not going to let them get away without resolving that. So we've tried to be proactive, and I've tried to work very hard. We've, we um, have found various uh, management companies that are willing to take over the day-to-day -day obligations. One of these companies says that uh, utilities and infrastructure is right up their alley, so they're not afraid of that. But in the meantime, we're trying to work forward with uh, the Army Corps of Engineers and come up with a, um, a water utility company, something similar to the North Shore Water Company at Dillingham Ranch. Um, so we're exploring options to see how we can uh, uh, get this problematic issue uh, resolved and keep the airfield going. So everybody knows the airfield um, is valuable. We all know it's valuable. We know it has a history, it has a long history. Uh, and uh, we would note also there, there were, there's always been people there, people, Hawaiian people there before. Uh, we mustn't forget that. And um, we, we, so that's, we just wanna take a few minutes. So thank you for listening for our updates on, uh, on the airfield and we'll, we'll continue to, to slug this out. Uh, and we'll, again, be up for questions later on. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and before we go to our question and answer, uh, we will be asking our four electeds uh, to provide a short legislative update. Um, so first, we'll go to Representative Sean Quinlan uh, for his update. Rep. Hello, everyone. Good evening. Uh, thanks very much for bearing with us through all this. Um, first of all, when it comes to the flooding, there are a few organizations and a few people that really stepped up for our community. And I wanna thank them right now publicly. Um, the Church of Latter-day Saints in Wailua. Oh my gosh, those guys were so amazing. Heidi and Nate Burgoyne ran such a tight ship. Um, they managed to get so many needed supplies to so many folks and, and help so many folks with their cleanup. Um, Haliva River of Life Mission, um, the North Shore Christian Fellowship, uh, Lori McCown, wow. I mean, she coordinated a huge cleanup effort behind Kalamoto. Um, and, and really, and Nate, Nate um, Sizzler, who, who lives down by Longbridge, he brought 80 United States Marines, more than 80 United States Marines, up to our district because she works at Indopaycom. And he managed to convince these guys to come up and help us out. And Nancy Salemi, um, I'm sure many of you have eaten at Cholo's. It's delicious. When I told Nancy that we had 80 Marines, She's the owner of Cholo's. I said, Nancy, we got 80 Marines coming up. Can you help me feed them? She said, well, first I told her there was 30. And then I, later I said, I'm sorry, there's actually 80. And she fed all of them without blinking an eye. I tried to pay her. She would not accept. So please, you guys, let's all go to Cholo's and have some food soon. Um, Senator Riviere, Rep. Matsumoto and I, in response to the flood, we introduced a resolution um, calling for attention on some of these issues, but it was already past the deadline for drafting and, and introducing resolutions. So with the help of our colleague, Scott Mariyoshi, the rep from Kaneohe, he was very gracious and he allowed us to replace the content of one of his resolutions that was already slated to be heard um, with our resolution, HR 81. And thank you everyone uh, who testified on that measure, but it calls upon, it, it sort of, it talks about all the different issues we face. It asked the Army Corps of Engineers 
um, to do a comprehensive study and make recommendations so we can figure out what we actually need to do. Um, it talks about debris removal. It talks about um, you know the emergency alerts, the flood flash alerts, uh, flash flood alerts. I, I you know I was so I live on Pala, and I happened to be I I come home early that Tuesday, and I was super excited, and I was going to spend some time with my son, and then the flash flood alert goes off, and I think, gosh, you know we had a lot of these lately, but I, why don't I take my son down to the river, and it'll be fun. We'll go see the river. We'll go see the ducks. You know I, I brought some bread with me, and we're gonna feed the ducks. And when I got down to the river, I was shocked and terrified at what I saw. I immediately called my wife. I said, come back here, grab Max, both of you, get in the car, get to Wahiwa. But by the time <clears throat> my wife had you know, gathered up enough stuff for a, a two-year-old child to survive for <laughs> six hours, which you, if you guys have two-year-olds, you know that's a lot of stuff. Um, the water, by the time she made it across the bridge over Opaula by McDonald's, the water was probably two feet high on the other side of the bridge. It was terrifying. And if the water had risen a little higher and a little faster, I wouldn't have made it out and, and my wife wouldn't have made it out. So that's uh, something that I've obviously been thinking about a lot over the past couple of weeks. And, and we're going to need, you know, I, I really want to thank, you know, besides Gil and, and Lauren for being so Thank you, Heidi. Um, Heidi Suniyoshi is a great council member um, she has been with us every step of the way, doing everything she can to help us and, and to make sure that we can be better next time and also to deal with the cleanup. Um, she helped us to get, uh, make sure that the, the, the tip stayed open um, and would accept, you know, more than two loads a day. Um, and, and Senator, I'm sorry, I served with him when he was in the Senate. Congressman Kehele, thank you so much for coming out, uh, touring the district with us, and we're really going to need you, and we're going to need the other members of our federal delegation because, to be really honest with you guys, the state and the city don't have the resources right now to totally, well, to even really start mitigating our problem. So we're going to really count on some federal dollars to come in and, and help us address some of these um, hydrodynamic issues, essentially. A uh, lone spot of, of bright news in all of this, um, in the House Capital Improvement Budget, we do have $1 million to continue to clean up at Wailea Ag also known as the homeless encampment by Belzee Land. Um, it's existed for probably almost 10 years in some form or another. And this past December, uh, thanks to a combination of federal and state and county law enforcement, we went in there, we served a bunch of warrants. Uh, we hopefully arrested most of the, the real bad actors because, I mean, it was a combination. Meth lab, chop shop, and there were all sorts of really, really bad things going on back there. And, and for all the folks who live in that area, it was really terrifying. They were setting fires. There were all sorts of noises and screams. Um, so the North Shore Community Land Trust now has a right of entry to the Mackay side of the parcel. Everything, uh, not everything, but a lot of the, the property, Mackay of the road. So they're going, they've already started um, certain parts of the, the cleanup. On the Malco side, um, we have a new, uh, some dairy farmers coming in. And you know the idea is basically we have to occupy the land uh, to prevent those criminals from returning. And with that million dollars that we've um, appropriated to the University of Hawaii, that's going to be you know, for cleanup, for mitigation, for taking away some of the garbage. There are unfortunately some hazardous materials on site uh, that we have to take care of. But the goal, long term, or my hope is that this can we can turn this into something for, for all of us, for the whole community. And it's something that we can pass down to our kids and their kids and something that we can really be proud of. And there's, there's, um, we can do lowly restoration. We can do fish pond restoration. It's such an incredibly beautiful property with so much history. And I really feel strongly that it, it should be for, for all of us. So thank you very much. And that's my report. Thank you. Um, next we'll go to representative Matsumoto. Thank you, Jacob. Um, I had an entire presentation prepared on legislation going through um, the legislature right now, but because of the really important issues of the floods um, with Dillingham and everybody on, I'm going to skip that presentation because I want to leave enough time for questions and answers um, at the end of the um, all of the presenters. But I did want to share really quick a few things um, so the one thing is every year my office 
has a survey go out to the district on important issues that are going through the legislature and how you feel about it. So if you live in District 45, you received a survey that looks like this um, and would appreciate um, for you to send that survey back to us if you can complete the survey by uh, April 16th. If you didn't get one, you can go on to my website at repmatsumoto.com. And right here is the link to participate in the online version of the survey. Um, so really would appreciate for those um, who live in the area to complete the survey. There's a lot of really important issues going through the legislature right now and would appreciate your feedback. Um, I also wanted to report every year, I say how important it is to get involved in the legislative process. Um, and this year, because of COVID, things are really different. You're not allowed to come to the Capitol anymore. Everything is remote testimony. Um, and I do feel that public input is so very important. Um, and so my office worked to put together uh, PDFs on how to get involved in the legislative process. I'll be putting these in the chat so you can download them, but they're a really easy way. Um, the first is how to register on the Hawaii State Capitol website. You need that. You need to register in order to use most of the functions on, on the website. Um, the next is how to sign up for measure tracking. So if there's issues you really care about, um, there's, often, there's only 48 hour notice um, before a bill is heard. And so this will send an email to you whenever there's action, um, when a bill is gonna be up for a committee hearing. So it's a great way to keep track of things going through the legislature. I often have people tell me I wanna give input, but I just don't know how. Um, and here's a really easy step-by-step um, -step process of how to write testimony that you can look up. And then this year, this is the big one, is how to submit testimony in this new Zoom uh, process. Um, and that's for those who've su submitted testimony before, there is there's a lot of different protocols this year because of COVID. So please take a look at that. I do encourage you to go through the survey um, and all of these PDFs, if you don't get them in the chat, they're also available on my website under information. They're right here on the legislative involvement instructions. So please go check those out. And again, if you have any wet questions, please contact my office. Um, the last thing that I wanted to do is just give a brief update on, um, I know we had reported that we had uh, secured a half a million dollars for design and um, plan of a new innovation center at Wailua High and Intermediate School. And I've been in talks with uh, Randy Tanaka, who is in charge of facilities in the Department of Education, as long as as well as with the principal um, and several of other educators, and um, really looking at whether in this time of COVID, if there is the funding, once we use that money for design and planning, are we going to get the funds in order to build out? Um, and that's a question we've all been having. There is a potential option instead of building a new building to retrofit or to remodel mm -hmm. um, current buildings to fit this innovation center idea that the high school has. And so that is something that's still in the works. I just wanted to give an update on that because I know it's something that um, people have been curious about um, over the past year. And with that, I will end my report um, again to leave time for a question and answer. And if, again, please don't hesitate to contact my office if you need anything. Thank you so much again for joining us tonight. Thank you, Rep. We're going to move on to Council Member Heidi Suniyoshi. Aloha and good evening, everyone. I just wanted to thank um, Senator Riviere for coordinating this meeting, to my counterparts, Representative Matsumoto and Quinlan for being here as well, and to Jacob for moderating, and most importantly to all of you from the community um, for being here to listen in. I know there's so much going on in the North Shore, so much that you have been through in the last couple of weeks, and I just wanted to um, send my sincere thoughts and concerns to everyone and to share with you a little bit about what the city's already doing to address the issues that you've been facing these last couple of weeks and some things that we're doing moving forward. I also did want to thank the presenters that came out from the state and the city, Director Babcock Toyo and Deputy Director M Millis for being here to present updates. 
So with that, um, I'm going to start with talking a little bit more about the Wailua Beach Road emergency repair that Deputy Director Millis was talking about with regards to the bridge. I know that did come out of um, nowhere for many and it happened over the weekend and there was concerns that I received about why did it close suddenly and what are we going to do about traffic, especially its proximity to schools and um, how long is it going to take. So I can completely understand the community's concerns about all that's going on with this bridge work repair, but I do have to say that um, hearing from deputy director and from other um, the director and other individuals looking at this situation, it's very important that this work be done. And I'm grateful that this work was identified as something that is being addressed as an emergency repair situation. As we know that road um, going in and out of Wailua is going to be very important for the community and should there be any kind of failure of that area then that can um, have catastrophic con consequences but i knew no one of the big issues is about the traffic that's going to happen in that area so from the department of transportation services um, we received um, the update that they are going to ensure that special duty officers are strate strategically placed during um, high peak times, such as um, during school drop off and pickup hours and over the long weekends. So um, there is plan to be again um, special duty officers to assist with um, traffic control. I know there's also been other um, requests from the community to look into traffic mitigation. Um, in the, in the vicinity to figure out how to better manage traffic flow at Thompson Corner and different places in the area. So we are looking at to see how we can better um, mitigate the traffic concerns as it unfolds. But again, I'm grateful that the city has identified this and is um, looking into it, as well as looking into uh, concerns on Anahulu Bridge and they will also be looking at Long Bridge. So um, for that, I am grateful because as we know within Haleiwa and Wailua, those three bridges are of great concern as far as their, their um, structural stability and also what happens under as far as the flow of water. So i um, grateful to the city departments who are doing that and also hoping the same attention will happen on twin bridges in Haleiwa town, which is a state bridge. So if that also happens and all four bridges that are of great concern for Haleiwa and Wailua area will be addressed. Um, so moving on with uh, re regards to legislation, as um, Director Babcock had mentioned, I introduced Resolution 21-77, requesting the city administration to develop a stream maintenance schedule for city-owned streams and floodways. So with this, it's asking for a focused approach on how to develop a schedule. I think what we've heard and what we've known for a long time is that um, maintenance has been deferred for many years for our streams and floodways. So this is to really develop a focused schedule of how um, this is going to be handled in the future. And um, there are attached to the resolution is going to be a list of what is owned by the city and also information about adopt a stream program. As we learned from what happened in recent weeks, the community really has a potential to really come out in force and be really the boots on the ground that's able to do so much that needs to happen and engaging the community is um, critical to how successful we are in doing what we need to do so look forward to working with the the community as we all work together to try to develop a comprehensive plan including areas that are privately owned and state owned and city owned and we work all together as was mentioned by many there needs to be a collaborative effort to deal with um, the maintenance of streams and floodways. So resolution 21-77 is moving on for final adoption at the full council. I did include a budget amendment for $5 million for that island wide um, program to clear the streams and floodways. I didn't wanna introduce legislation without enabling funding to be able to do the work that's being done. So we just had a budget meeting today, a long budget meeting and that 5 million has stayed in the budget. And um, Moving on quickly to just a wind turbine issues, um, jumping tracks real quickly, but um, there's been issues of the wind turbines in Kahuku and about the um, about the setbacks from schools and from residences. So I introduced a five mile setback. The DPP um, came back with an amendment for a 1500 foot setback. Um, Planning Commission after hearing from the residents is agreeable to looking to, um, into, um, compromise between the two. And so we're gonna be um, coming back to Planning Commission with a recommendation from the community that strikes a balance between the five mile and 1500 foot setback. So I can provide you with updates um, 
on that should you want to know more about that. Just wanted to highlight from our budget, we did um, put in uh, $1,500,000 for the planning and design and construction and inspection of a canoe halau at Haliba Beach Park, Malka. We also put in two, added a $2 million to bridge rehabilitation at various locations um, to um, include Hubukea Road ditch, Drain Ditch and Hakoila Bridge. Um, both of those are still in, so there's $2 million for those, that rehab. And as mentioned, the stream and floodway maintenance program at $5 million. And I did also want to talk about our, um, our work to do the relocation of the Wailua Fire Station. As you know, the Wailua Fire Station is actually in a floodway. So at the recent floods, everything at Wailua Fire Station in Haleiwa had to be relocated up to Wahiwa, which caused everyone great concern because to have your first responders relocated out of your community during an emergency situation is not a good thing. So we are working very closely with HFD and with the city administration to relocate the Wailua Fire Station up and out of the flood zone. A property has been acquired, which was a main component of our work moving forward. 150,000 is already in the budget for planning and design of that fire station and construction estimated at $14 million. All of that is moving forward and um, to make uh, Wailua Fire Station a first of its kind response area for the North Shore area. So that is very good news. As we know, our ability to have um, critical first responders have everything they need in your community is critical. So very happy that the Wailua Fire Station relocation is underway. There's also been a lot of discussion on the Haliva Walkways project um, going through Haliva Town. And so there was a presentation at the North Shore Neighborhood Board, and that is moving forward as well to improve the walk, the road and walkways in Haliva Town. Um, that is a pretty detailed information about where that project has gone. So um, if you wanted to know more about that, you can look into Neighborhood Board minutes from the last North Shore Neighborhood Board or call our office. Quickly, I'll just run through other North Shore projects that are underway. Wailua District Park ball field lighting improvements, 90% complete. You'll see that the ball field lighting is already up at Wailua District Park. Laniakea Beach support park fencing has already been up. Haliva Ali'i Beach Park Recreation Center improvements. There will be a demolition of the second floor, which was um, added for the Baywatch. Um, that area, the second floor of the Haliva Lee Beach Park Recreation Center has become undermined. It was really just, um, constructed as a prop for Baywatch. So it's finally out to bid to, um, to demolish that second floor and restabilize that Haliva Lee Beach Park Recreation Center. So that's underway. Wailua District Park swimming pool water line improvements. As we know, that one has been ongoing for a very long time, but we do now have an estimated completion date for the summer. So we're hopeful for that. Um, Rainbow Bridge improvements um, the re to repair and rehabilitate the historical 170 foot long um, double arch concrete bridge, what was just talked about. We're looking into improvements to that. Also the rehabilitation of streets, that's a Haliva walkway improvements going through Haliva town. The bid is being prepared for that. So that's moving forward. Um, Haliva Beach Park shoreline improvements. Um, we're, we're underway for scope and development to um, improvements to construction of the tea growing that's already existing there at Haliva Beach Park to make sure that that Haliva Beach Park Park shoreline is protected with a, a more um, improvements to that tea growing. Haliva Road drainage improvements. This is also a very important um, project to address the issue of drainage along Haliva Road. So there is um, a project to plan and the projects in plan and design are ready to plan and design and install drainage sumps and piping to release stormwater in the area between 66-420 to 66-450 Haliva Road and creating a release into Kayaka Bay Beach Park natural drain. So um, the city is very focused already on making sure we start moving water out of Haliva Town in any and every way we can in every way that the city is responsible for. Um, Kalkunahoa Road Street Lighting Projects, we have a future project to improve the lighting on Kalkunahoa Road. Ki'i Ki'i Stream Dredging, the dredging of Ki'i Ki'i Stream of silt and debris that is reducing the capacity of the stream is under plan and design phase now already. Um, Wailua District Park, again, swimming pool lights, that's a, that's a continuation of everything that's going on at Wailua Swimming Pool. And just real briefly, Haliva, um, Haula uh, is also a neighboring and of concern when the flooding happened. Haula, we've um, worked with them to 
um, prepare plans for resiliency hub there. As you know, the North Shore and Windward communities really have um, lack of services as it comes to emergency shelters and emergency services in the event of emergencies. The Windward coastline is also um, lacking in that. So um, Haula Resiliency Hub has been um, appropriated 2.7 million for plan design and construction. And knowing that a resiliency hub is important for all our coastal and um, communities like North Shore who have um, had to deal with emergency situations. There's also a resolution and money has been approved to develop action plans for resiliency hubs throughout areas such as the North Shore and Windward area who have um, been lacking with emergency services and emergency um, facilities like shel emergency shelters in your area. So with that, um, I do wrap up my report and open for any questions at the time, questions open. But again, thank you to the community for all, in all the ways that you've stepped up for yourselves and look forward to standing with you and supporting you in any way we can from the city level and to work together with our state representatives and federal delegations as well. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and our for our last report before question and answers, we'll go to Senator Revere. Thank you. Um, there's a lot of unusually lot of bills this year. And I'm not going to bore you with the, the details of each of them. There's a lot of mundane bills. There's a couple of good ones, a couple of uh, couple of bad ones, but no real stinkers this year. Uh, one of the good bills that I want to highlight is uh, based on our work to try to close the loopholes on some of these ag CPRs that are turning into, uh, you know, gentlemen estates kind of through the back door. So there was a task force that I participated in and helped get, you know, helped uh, get going and was, you know, part of. And it came up with the results uh, and the recommendations to change some of the reporting levels uh, and requirements for agricultural CPRs. That is a House Bill 247 is the remaining vehicle for that. Um, and it is coming up to its final committee hearing. So I hope that you folks will uh, um, use uh, Representative Matsumoto's uh, how to testify notes and get in there and testify in support of HB 247. Um, there's one other one uh, that's I don't think is very good. And that's House Bill 502 which would change the, the definition of the minimum lot size for rural land classifications from a half acre to a quarter acre. And while we don't presently have rural land classification at the state level on this island, one could easily see developers buying up agriculture land, going for a land classification identified as rural because it would be much easier to change than into urban and they would be selling lots at just over 10,000 square feet. So I think that's, that's one that I, I'm the only one apparently that's voted against this or noticed it. And I really think it, it could be a potentially um, pernicious bill in the future and not yet, but it could become. I wanna make two quick announcements and then we wanna get on to question and answers. The MDA, at the, if you've been to the neighborhood board meetings, uh, uh, a lot of the, our friends on this call today um, have talked about the missile defense agency and the gigantic radar system proposed above Waialee and Kahuku. Um, they're seeking comments. They're seeking public comments until April 12th. And you can find information about that gigantic radar system, which uh, they may probably deliver to Kauai, the Barking Sands. Um, but I, I don't know anybody that wants it on this island. So if you want to comment on it and learn more about it, mda.mil, mda.mil and look about midway down the page and look for the radar system for Hawaii. You'll find information. And finally, I wanna make an announcement on behalf of Keep the North Shore Country. The Habitat Conservation Plan that Keep the North Shore Country has been fighting for these last four years has finally come to the Supreme Court. The oral arguments at the Supreme Court will be tomorrow at 2 p.m. So if you're interested in watching and learning about the Napua Makani wind farm and, and how inadequate their plan is for protecting endangered species, that'll be at two o'clock on youtube.com slash Hawaii courts. And I will turn over the, uh, my time uh, for question and answer because uh, I know we don't have much time. Let's keep it going. Thank you. All right, thank you. And thank you to um, those of you who have questions. Uh, we're gonna go into the question and answer period now. Um, I did uh, write down some of the questions that were asked earlier, um, but if you do have any additional questions, uh, please put them in the chat um, and we'll get right to it. Um, you know, we, we've received a lot of questions uh, regarding uh, private 
owners of various waterways, you know, and you know, many of you in, uh, in the chat have expressed, um, how do we get them to take responsibility uh, for maintaining these um, waterways? And is there anything that the state and city can do to um, mandate that? Um, you know, I'll first point this question to maybe Council Member Heidi Suniyoshi um, and our folks from the city, because I know there's already existing city ordinance uh, that do hold these uh, private um, owners responsible. Uh, Council Member, um, and then any of the other city uh, departments who want to chime in. Thank you, Jacob. And I did see a lot of the comments. One in particular is about a drainage around Railua Beach Road. TJ, I know that that's a great concern. And there, that um, particular drainage, we are talking to um, Director Babcock about it. The, the um, ownership of that has gone through different iterations throughout the years. But either way, we're going to work and come out to see what we can do to address that issue. Um, it is difficult with regards to ownership and um, different property owners are unaware of what they need to do or could do. So I think the very first thing we need to do is to um, address areas of concern that you may see in your area, then we can help identify who the property owners are and um, work with the property owners to let them know how and what they need to do re to remediate the situations and provide our assistance as we can to uh, make sure that we try our best to work in collaboration with the property owners to rectify the situation. In instances of large property owners, um, such as there's been a time when Dole and others have owned um, waterways, then we'd, we'd have to work with those large entities as well. So um, this really just brings to light that we need to be addressing all the different areas of the waterways and identifying who owns what and whose responsibility it falls under. So under resolution 21-77, we're going to put everything that falls under this city. I'm also going to be introducing a similar one um, that, that lists everything that falls under the state. Anything else that you see is most likely um, privately held areas and we can work together to figure out how we can address that with through the Department of Planning and Permitting and um, work through that process. Thank you. And then uh, maybe we'll move on to our state le um, legislators. Uh, you know, has there been any state um, measures um, to try to hold these private landowners uh, responsible for the maintenance of these um, waterways? Well, they actually used to be, Jacob. Um, and I can't remember when it changed. I want to say maybe 20 years ago, the, the city and county was responsible. And then we changed it to make the private landowners responsible. And it is, I mean, it's going to be a very difficult problem to solve. because We're talking about a lot of money and a lot of resources. And not everybody who happens to live along a, a waterway that will flood has those resources. So you know, my, my hope or my wish is that between the federal government, the state government and the city government, we can come up with a plan and one or several pots of money and the equipment and the manpower um, and work out agreements with folks so that we can clear these streams. Because if, if we just say, well, gosh, it's the private landowner's responsibility and that's that, I don't think we'll ever be able to really solve the problem. Um, Senator or Representative Matsumoto, um, any further comment on that? I think Senator Revere had a few comments. I was going to pass it on to him. It's um, tricky. You know, the Albizia trees grow really big. We've been, you know, people up in Pupukeo will know this, that the Albizias have, have gone out of control. And you, you go and you yell and scream at your neighbor and tell them, you know, take down those giant trees that are falling onto my yard. And it, it's been difficult. We passed a bill a couple years ago. I'm, this is the reason I'm giving this story about Albizia. The um, couple years ago, we passed a bill that if it's a vacant lot and people are neglecting it, you can go in there and, and do what you need to do to protect your own property. Um, I think this serves as an example, though. If we go up and you saw the maps and all the thousands of streams around the island, um, it can be challenging trying to get in and um, identify um, you know, where, where, the, where the timber is or the debris or the whatnot, much of it is the state. And so I think that's what people are probably really asking us. And I, I do think we need to come up with a better response by DLNR. Uh, the stream clearance <laughs> isn't doing the job. I have proposed this in the past and we're gonna go back and look at it again. Uh, a couple of years ago, I put in to have a, a dedicated, uh, like a tree core within DLNR so that they would just, that's their job to, to go out, clear streams, knock down trees that are uh, impacting roads and 
you know, wires and cabling. And um, it's just something that hasn't been funded due to monetary things. So I like uh, council members uh, suggestion about the adopt a stream program. And I think that's what we have to do. I think, I think all of us, I think this entire community, we can't let this leave from our minds. We've got to remember it. And we've probably got to take it upon ourselves to be more proactive with our neighbors and with ourselves and, uh, and, and keep this top of mind that we come up with some processes for uh, clearing streams and going up where we know there's some known problems and taking care of it. Thank you, Senator. Jacob, um, if I could, oh, sorry, Jacob, oh, well, real quickly. I just wanted to say, um, in, but um, with regards to the privately held areas, a lot of the government held areas, such as I just talked about under bridges and our culverts and different things that the city and state has identified as floodway areas. I think um, a great place to start is to make sure that the state and city are doing a good job, like on the Windward coastline. It, um, a lot of the issues happen underneath bridges and within um, the, the North Shore area, a lot of the issues are underneath the bridges that are city owned. So um, as I talked earlier, the city already is doing about four to five areas for key, key stream mitigation and different things. So I can just say that from this city's viewpoint, and I know my counterparts of the state are focused on it as well, that to clean the areas where the water needs to flow out is a great place to start. I know there's a lot of areas within the private areas that are co contributing to as it goes downstream, but we do need to make sure that those areas that flow out aren't blocked. So I just want to communicate that we're very focused on making sure that those outflows aren't blocked. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and the next question uh, I'll pose to um, Hero from the city's uh, Department of Emergency Management. Um, there were a few comments asking why was the National Guard not uh, deployed to help with the heavy equipment. Um, and there was also a question on, you know, when the water levels are high, um, you know, how will the emergency vehicles, fire truck, ambulance um, get through? Um, I know you answered this question the other night, um, but if you can answer it here. Yeah, and um, I think I touched a little bit on the National Guard issue, but I'll go again there. So um, actually, we do work very closely with the Hawaii National Guard. We, um, in fact, have a, a member that's throughout the COVID response been embedded in our uh, emergency operations center. So um, throughout the whole response, um, National Guard was with us, and uh, we any requests for the National Guard support actually would go through um, the state EOC through Luke's department. Um, but, uh, you know, I'll go back to this. Um, so for the areas for which we had responsibility to take action, um, we did not have a need for the National Guard at the time of the incident uh, for them to take action. I think the desire from the community was that we activate the National Guard to assist with um, cleanup um, on their property. And we heard about the Marine Corps, but they were there as volunteers, not as the United States Marine Corps. So it's, it's not easy for us to just say, like, let's get the National Guard in there to help clean people's homes. Um, they have uh, jurisdictional authorities and like, you know, of course, we would have to request for that. So if it's something that the city was responsible for, then we could request for the National Guard to come in and assist with us. But we can't um, go and ask them to do something that's not part of our mission. So, I, you know, I know that's not... Um, uh, what um, folks want to hear, but that's that's just the reality of um, the, the limitations on our authority and things we can request the National Guard for, for assistance with. Um, with regard to uh, uh, the traversing of um, emergency vehicles in flood conditions, um, the reality is they won't be able to traverse um, once the flood what flooding gets so bad. You know, it's, we, uh, we ask them to go uh, put themselves in harm's way day in and day out with all the response, um, but there is a limit to what they can and cannot do. Um, so that's why, you know, we were leaning forward to identify larger vehicles that may be able to traverse through um, uh, higher water levels. So um, we had uh, some borrowed some uh, large trucks from uh, Rogers Department to potentially assist with uh, search and rescue missions if they came to that. Um, but, but really, again, the reality is um, our emergency response capabilities have limitations. So um, we, we just won't be able to respond under certain conditions. Um, I did see a couple comments on sirens, so I do want to address that again. Um, so at, for, for this flooding event, um, we made the determination when we got the notification from the weather service, and, and I acknowledge the time was very short, um, but you know, we, we issued the alert as soon as we got it from the weather service. Um, and uh, I, I do want to make it clear that it's not just us issuing the warning messages. National Weather Service directly issues the message as soon as they have the information. So it doesn't have to go through this entire bureaucratic process for the alert messages to go out. What we're doing is to actually augment the messages that the uh, weather service sends out with our own message 
Um, so I just want to make it clear that um, it's not the warning message it isn't going through this whole bureaucratic mess before it gets out to the public. Um, but with regard to the sirens, um, the decision at the time for, for us was um, uh, because it was a very localized area, we believe the best course of action was to use the, uh, the cell phone alerts, the, um, the emergency alert system, um, and also to have the first responders go out into the community to do notifications. Um, it's actually very helpful for me to see the feedback that um, folks wanted us to use the siren system. So um, for future flooding incidents, um, we do have plans to use the sirens for uh, dam breach scenarios. But for again, for like this riverine flooding incidents, um, we didn't have protocols to use the siren system. We also at the time made the assessment that that wasn't the appropriate way. But um, seeing the feedback tonight actually is kind of helpful for me. So we'll definitely take that into consideration. And um, as we uh, go through the after action process, consider that for future events. Thank you. Um, and then the next question um, is going to be for uh, Roger and maybe Haku. Um, but there was a question in the chat about um, asking uh, what exactly caused the damage to the bridge on Wailua Beach Road and how long are we looking at getting it uh, fixed? Hi, this is Haku. Um, I'm not sure what's happening right now. Can you guys hear me? Yes. We can okay, hear you. sorry. Um, no, so the, the damage to the bridge was caused by, you know, the speed and the amount of water running underneath the bridge. It just eroded the ground. Um, and as I mentioned before, unfortunately, we're, we're not going to know how long it'll take until we get in there and start doing the work and we can really see how bad the damage is. Um, I know that's not the answer um, you guys want to hear, and it's not what you guys deserve. We, we hope to have a better idea next week, but I can't even promise by then um, we'll have an idea. Um, the actual schedule uh, and when we will know for sure how long the bridge is going to be out uh, is when we start construction. Um, and we won't know that until we start getting with the uh, agencies and the permits that are required for us to to get in there. Thank you. Um, you know, we're going to move on to the next question. Um, Angela wrote in the chat, what provisions are made to ensure that native endangered uh, and protected stream life is not destroyed uh, during the cleaning of streams? Um, maybe if we still have the Department of Land and Natural Resources on um, or if any of our elected officials want to take a stab at that question. Maybe Roger can answer that. That's, um, you know, because I believe the city has the uh, programmatic EIS, right? And, and I think the state has done that. And as you mentioned, the, uh, the, the stream mouths, uh, it is, there's pre-approval to get in there. So those were looked at, were they not? Environmentally, could you maybe share a little bit on that? Sure, yeah, that's correct, um, Senator and, and everyone else. The, um, we do have the permits to work in the areas that we have permits for, and that does include uh, requirements for uh, water quality, maintaining water quality, and also addressing any um, species that are there. Normally, uh, it's invasive kind of species that is being cleared. Uh, Senator was referring to opening the stream mouths. And if the folks, if there's folks who live near Kaile Pulu, they know that there's a, there's a whole procedure for opening a stream mouth where um, they have to put out booms. They, they come first, put out booms. Uh, they also have to clear all the trash uh, from the area as much as they can. And then they open the stream so that it doesn't pollute the ocean in that case. Um, but any work that's done in stream is, is covered under a permit. So we have, it's all included in that link. There's a long list of uh, standard operating procedures and accepted practices, which would be protective of water quality and uh, native species. Um, look, I, I wanna chime in on this really quickly. I, <laughs> I, I consider myself <clears throat> a great environmentalist. I mean, at least I, I hope I am. Um, I, I care a lot about endangered species. I, I care a lot about our native species. But the reality is there's only so much care that we can take if, if we really want to tackle this flooding problem um, in a reasonable amount of time with a reasonable amount of money. There's only so much that we can do to protect potentially native species as, as we 
dredge these streams. I think that's just that's just the truth of it. Thank you. Thanks. Um, you know, and so on to our next uh, question and comment. Um, there was a some uh, someone wrote in the chat. Where would people go to find out um, if they uh, qualify for the relief assistance uh, once it is approved? Um, not sure who to point that question to. Hey, I mean, you can hear about that. So um, any kind of um, uh, relief program that becomes available, um, there'll be lots of public communication out about this. Um, uh, we'll make sure to put it up on the uh, the DM website as well, but you'll see press releases and messages and all sorts of stuff. So um, hopefully we can um, get uh, whatever relief programs available out to you folks um, very soon. Thank you. Um, you know, there was a, a question um, from Maka and Napua. Uh, when will we have the clearance to put up our tsunami signs? That's for me again. Um, so uh, yeah, there are. Um, there was a study done on uh, tsunami evacuation routes, and it was based on the uh, the extreme tsunami evacuation scenario. Um, so uh, what we're doing right now is uh, we're seeking uh, funding um, from uh, FEMA to to go through with this project. Um, so it's uh, in process right now. We applied for it a little while back. So um, had some back and forth regarding some questions FEMA had, but um, hopefully that award will be coming shortly. Thanks. Um, there was a question in the chat. Uh, could you please comment on traffic management uh, if the Rainbow Bridge is closed? If we are heading back into gridlock, how can we conduct an emergency evacuation for a local event? I'll just um, speak to that one. We were, um, the Department of Transportation Services is acknowledging as um, Deputy Director Mill has talked about that um, with both bridges, we're not sure the duration or what is gonna be the situation, but I, I see within the chat, a lot of questions are about um, emergency vehicles and how they get over now Wailua Bridge. Um, I'm almost certain, but I, I can reconfirm that the emergency vehicles will still be able to go across the Wailua Bridge um, with regard to if and when on a Hulu Bridge maybe have to have um, also some closures. How is that going to work out? Um, we do definitely will need to keep in contact with the community and with Department of Transportation Services to make sure that um, traffic is able to flow. So as we get more information, as Deputy Director Milis um, mentioned, as we get more information on how long the closures will have to be and what needs to be done, we can definitely work to make sure that there's a traffic management plan in place. And especially for the fact that emergency vehicles will be able to have the quickest route to the community. So this is a situation that's unfolding as it's going through. We have a um, fairly large comprehensive meeting already set for Monday um, with all the different departments to talk about this and other issues. So we can, um, you can contact our office for updates on this and we will do our best to get information out to the communities as well as the situation unfolds. Thank you. Um, the next question I'll pose uh, maybe to Senator first um, and then if, if anyone else wants to chime in. Uh, why is there no unified uh, team aligning all departments to jointly maintain the flow on streams? That's a great question. I, I think as anybody that's been uh, you know participating in this tonight, you can see that it is disjointed and it needs a, it needs a coordination and a review. And that's, uh, as, as I was saying, we've got to work on this together and, and we will try, we will endeavor to try to bring some coordination together, but if the lands are private and they're up there, it's, it's uh, we're going to need individual landowners to, to be part of it too. Um, anybody else wanna chime in on that one? Uh, if not, we'll move on to the next question. Um, the next question is off the topic of the flood, um, but it's related to tourism. Um, how can we educate the public and especially the tourists as to the risk of high surf? When people get into trouble, they put our lifeguards and fire departments at risk. Um, what can be done? Well, we, we have asked for years, the legislature has asked that all the airlines flying here show some kind of a safety video that makes it very clear the, the dangers that people face because, I mean, this is an endemic. I mean, it, 
these islands are almost like uh, they're a trap for some people in a, in a weird way because our waters, our currents are so strong, um, our waters are so rough, and our drowning rate is like several times the national average. A lot of folks come here on vacation and end up either, you know, having a cardiac arrest because they have to exert themselves too much or, or, or they just legitimately drown or they get blown out of a blowhole and, and, and break their neck. And, and we've asked Hawaiian Airlines had a number of conversations over the years, please, please, please show a video in multiple languages, wherever, wherever they're coming from, when they land and tell folks like this, this is the reality. You know, this is what happens here. Uh, thus far, um, we have been unsuccessful, but it's something that I'm going to keep working on. And in fact, I just had a number of meetings on it uh, right before the pandemic hit. Um, but no, I, I agree completely. Like it, it's, it's kind of ridiculous. And our lifeguards, God bless them, they do their best. But I've heard so many horror stories from them of, you know, they'll tell people, there was a guy maybe five years ago and the lifeguard he ended up dying. The lifeguard saw him like taking a surfboard out to the water. And he was like, Hey man, you know, like not today, not today. Don't go surf. Don't go surf. And the guy didn't really speak English. And he nodded. And 10 minutes later, the guy was gone, you know? So that's, um, I, I agree completely. I can chime in on this a bit. Um, I actually had legislation moving through, um, last session on a pamphlet with information that would be given to all travelers along with um, other forms that they're supposed to be given, right? We are supposed to fill out your form of what you're bringing into the state. Um, and it was moving through the legislature. And then of course the pandemic hit. Um, and so that was addressing things like high surf, um, native plants and animals, hiking, safety, all of those kind of issues. And so that was working through um, having the Hawaii Tourism Authority work in conjunction um, with DOT to get that information out. Again, because the pandemic hit, I didn't reintroduce it this year. Um, because I felt like there was a lot of pressing issues on the house side. We have a limit of bills that we're allowed to put in. Um, and there's also the issue of cost. I didn't want to put in any legislation that increased cost during a time where we um, are really hurting for funds in the government. So, but again, it's an issue that we're aware of and our, um, our office had been working on last session. And if you are interested in um, continuing that conversation, please contact my office um, to take an up on a future legislative session date. Thank you. Uh, we're going to move on to um, some questions regarding the Dillingham airfield. Um, I think this question came from uh, Shannon, um, but her question was, the water supply to the airfield also affects Mokulaia residents near the airfield. The system goes down quite often and sometimes with no warning. Residents are concerned about the maintenance issues and with the future of this supply, if and when Dillingham Ranch is sold. Can Senator Riviere and or Rep Matsumoto explain what actions are being taken in regard to the water issue? So most of the, yeah, most of the, most of the people in Mokulaia are on the Dillingham Ranch uh, system, which is the North Shore Water Company. Um, the airfield is on a different well and a different system. Um, and yes, I'm well aware that the, the, the Dillingham Ranch system is not very good and has had some problems. Um, and it has been addressed multiple times as the Dillingham Ranch tries to go forward with their subdivision plan. So they do need to maintain the system. Um, it is not robust enough. The fire hydrants are inadequate. Um, and so that is, that is very true. Uh, it's not directly related to the airfield is, is the short answer on that. Um, Maybe they should be connected together. And just for those who say, well, maybe we should all be on board of water supply because um, the board of water supply goes to much of Waialua, but it ultimately ends, you know, when you get at some point, it would be very expensive to add the, the reservoirs and the wells and the pumps and the uh, whatnot. So I've been told to, uh, to complete the water, board of water supply system down the highway. So it's an ongoing issue. But Rep, uh, is there anything you want to add to that? Um, he, Senator covered a lot of it, um, but just um, remembering that the water system, again, the Army owns Dillingham Airfield, and so a lot of the say with what happens with that water system is up to them. Um, and so for the, there are a few users off of that system that are not on the airfield. Um, and again, working to 
negotiate that system with the army and seeing if there's a way to make improvements like we had mentioned in in the conversation that that's one of the top two issues that we've been working on and it's a difficult one um that's for sure but um we're all working really diligently on trying to find a creative solution thanks um brian asked does the faa have anything to say about the situation going on at the airfield the question was faa uh, in yes. the air. yeah i have something here hang on um you know the faa it's really important the uh, the department of transportation has to follow faa guidelines and standards and the state of hawaii department of transportation receives on the order of maybe 75 million dollars a year from the faa for uh, various airport projects so dot cannot reasonably be in violation of FAA guidelines. And there's been talk back and forth between DOT as they have announced that they wanna close the airfield. But I have this letter here from February 1st from the FAA and it says, for the record, FAA does not currently support DOT's plan. Your plan does not contain sufficient detail on how DOT will accommodate all the existing users at the airfield. DOT should not, should not move forward with the proposed June 30th lease termination without FAA concurrence or a viable relocation plan. I haven't been able to meet that terms yet. Later on in the letter, it says, prior to terminating your lease, you will need FAA approval to build, allow, or propose new facilities at the state um, airfield to airport. So to do anything, they're going to need FAA approval. And then it says, whatever you're doing, please submit your revised plan to the department at least six months prior to ending your lease at the airfield so that FAA can conduct a comprehensive review. So according to the FAA, they cannot shut it down on June 30th. But we, like I said in the beginning, we haven't been able to get a straight answer from DOT um, as to where that is. So that is all part of the big negotiation, uh, I guess. Brett, um, anything to add to that? I'm just focusing on the FAA talking about reasonable accommodation. Um, and I think that was something that was really important because as we've talked with many of the tenants out there, um, Kavaihapai is so special, right? There's a lot of um, things with the topography, with just on how um, the mountain range is there that they're really isn't um, options currently um, for the tenants there, or they really are gonna have to work on figuring out what those reasonable accommodations are. Um, and I, there are a few things, but there, that would require work and it would require time. And so I think that's something to, that's really important is to focus on that, that concept of reasonable accommodations. Thanks, and our last question um, relating to the um, airfield is coming from Edward and Edward asked uh, what steps can individual affected stakeholders take to ensure that our rights are protected very good news that the Attorney General is involved but what actions would you advocate to eliminate the risk of the dual track crash and burn that's we need we need DOT to um recognize that the uh, airfield tenants cannot both vacate and stay in business and plan for the long term. So it's it's clear that it, it can't be both ways. And uh, again, we're seeking clarification from, from the department. I'll just continue the same thing. Yeah, clarity is something that's really important. We're within that 90 days of that June 30th deadline that was set. Um, and so it really is important to know how to move forward because on, on one hand, like they said, we're working on that joint use agreement. There is a lot of talks with the AG and DOT and Army, um, but there still is those eviction notices. And so I have been um, on several calls this week um, with DOT um, and members in the um, executive office to talk about the tenants out there needing clarity um, because it is difficult and knowing how to move forward when they're pursuing two paths. And so again, doing my best to 
have those conversations and make sure that we provide that and hopefully provide that sometime soon. There are several meetings slated for the next week and a half. Um, and I'm hoping we have more information. If you do want updates in regards to Kavaiho Pai Airfield, again, please reach out to my office and I know and or Senator Riviere's office and we'd be happy to provide those updates because there are many meetings um, for a lot of different issues pertaining to the airfield that are happening um, in the next few weeks. So we'll have more information as it goes forward. We have about five minutes left, um, but I do wanna ask uh, two last questions. Uh, Diane Fitzsimmons wrote, with the bridge closure on Wailua Beach Road, traffic is horrendous on Thompson Corner. Are there any plans to prevent a serious accident on this only road leading to and from Wailua and Mokulea? Uh, so Thompson Corner is actually slated for uh, traffic light and uh, road rehabilitation, they call it. I'm hoping that means they're going to smooth out the dip at the bottom of the hill, but the project's not supposed to start until this fall, actually. It was announced probably 18 months ago. Um, so we have asked DOT for a temporary traffic light um, at Thompson Corner, and just thanks very much to Heidi <clears throat> for arranging those uh, special duty officers in the meantime. Thanks. And then um, there was a question um, that was directed to Council Member Suniyoshi, um, and I want to make sure that uh, this question gets asked. Um, Joe wrote, Council Member Suniyoshi, in today's Star Advertiser, there's a notice of public hearing Tuesday, April 6th, regarding the DPP process to adopt rules and regulations governing short-term rentals pursuant to Ordinance 1918, uh, Bill 89. Would you please share your concerns and or recommendation about the rules to help guide public input to ensure that our neighborhoods are not overrun by STRs. Um, can you also please update us about enforcement efforts regarding this ordinance? Sure, thank you for that question, Joe. With regards to the, um, the next step of um, the process to go out to public comment for rules and regulations that will drive behind Bill 89 and their opening of a new classification of vacation rentals, which is primarily just focused on bread and breakfast units. Um, first, I wanna um, highlight the fact that there will be no allowed use of the increase of bed and breakfast units within the North Shore. That was based on the recommendation that within the North Shore Sustainable Communities Plan um, that was, um, gone through it and has been adopted by the community. The North Shore community um, specifically specified within the North Shore Sustainable Community Plan no increase of vacation rentals in the North Shore communities. So the North Shore communities won't see any allow, increase allowed use for vacation rentals based on that recommendation in Sustainable Communities Plan. But with regards to what's going to happen in other areas throughout the city and county that is a um, concern based on what we've seen um, that has happened and continues to happen with the enforcement of illegal vacation rentals. The Department of Planning and Permitting has been trying a number of different ways to um, clamp down on vacation rentals, but I know they're still having a number of issues with the enforcement process, which is, has always been the concern. With regards to how bed and breakfast vacation rentals are gonna be enforced once they reopen, um, the reason why it was specified for only bed and breakfast is that there needs to be an occupant there that's regulating the bed and breakfast. So the enforcement efforts with relation to what's gonna be allowed now based on Bill 89 is supposed to be easier to enforce because they're only gonna be bread and breakfast bed and breakfast and not standalone units. But as the process moves forward, we'll um, be sure to keep you updated and what the finalized rules are gonna be in regards to that ordinance. And um, we, the DPP is continuing to make sure that they do a better job in enforcing the issue of illegal, illegal vacation rentals. I would like to take this moment though to, to talk about the North Shore Sustainable Community Plan because it is up for review. And one of the points of discussion is gonna be whether or not at this point in time, based on action that's been taken as far as opening up for bed and breakfast units in other areas throughout the city, whether the North Shore does wanna open up a portion to um, bed and breakfast or not, that's gonna be a part of the discussion in the North Shore Sustainable Communities Plan. So um, that is gonna be a point of discussion for the North Shore. Thank you. Um, and I know there are more questions out there, um, but we are uh, nearing our end time. Um, but um, at the end, I will make sure that uh, we post in the chat the contact information for all, for all of our uh, elected leaders who are on the call. Um, but we're going to move to um, some short closing 
remarks. Uh, we'll start with Senator R um, Riviere and then move to Representatives Matsumoto, Quinlan, and then we'll close out with Council Member Suniyoshi. So, Senator, the floor is yours. Thanks, everybody, for uh, coming in and participating. You know, we're learning. Even this meeting um, may not have had all the answers that uh, we wanted or expected or hoped, but this dialogue is helpful. It is helpful for, you know, for um, we, the, the, the political guys, it's helpful for the agencies to get the feedback, to have the discussion, and to try to, try to work forward. So um, let's look at this as the start. And um, you are encouraged to uh, keep our feet to the fire to try to keep this moving. So let's all work in the, on these issues together. Thank you very much for uh, participating tonight. Aloha. Thank you. I also wanted to echo just thanking everyone for coming out, having such a great turnout um, and all of the questions. And I recognize we didn't get to all of the questions. Um, and I know on behalf of my office, and I'm sure the rest of the offices will do the same is going through the chat afterwards um, and trying to answer all of the questions. I believe we have all of your email addresses when you signed up for this event um, and doing our best to get back to you. I know it might be frustrating. There's so many questions that went into the chat that we weren't able to get to um, just in the amount of time, but we will, I know, do our best to get back to everybody and answer all of your questions. If we don't, send us an email um, and please, please be on us. I know there was one quick question about what we're doing differently this year um, that you've been through the process with um, DOT and Dillingham and trying to get a long-term lease. Um, and I just want to answer that real quick. I think what's happening that I could say is different this time is that there's a lot of attention on it. Um, there's a lot of people involved. It's not just DOT working with the Army to make a lease. Um, again, you have the representative, you have the senator, you have a, you have a congressman, the lieutenant governor, you have state community stakeholders, community leaders, all coming together and bringing a lot of attention to this issue. And so I think it's actually very different this time around than it was in previous years. Now, I wasn't around in previous years um, when they were trying to obtain that long-term lease, but I do think there's a big effort and a lot of collaboration that I think makes a big difference. And so again, thank you everybody for uh, coming out tonight, and I just really appreciate the dialogue. Like Senator said, it makes our job so we know what you need, and it's really important. So thank you. Thank you, Rep. Representative Quinlan. Thanks, Jacob. And, and really, I want to thank Jacob here publicly. Um, he has done a great job moderating uh, all these town halls for us and really appreciate uh, Senate Communications assisting us with all this stuff. So thank you, Jacob. Um, thank you to all of our presenters today. I really appreciate your guys' time. Um, Hero, Luke, you guys have been fantastic. Thanks for touring the district personally um, with Senator and, and uh, Rep and, and Council Member and I. Um, uh, you guys, I posted my cell phone number in the chat. You can just text me, call me, please, not too late. Um, and uh, just a big mahalo again to all of our volunteers, to all of our, everyone who donated supplies, everybody who helped out with the flood, flood relief and, and the effort. Thank you. Thank you so much. Mahalo. And last but not least, uh, Council Member Heidi Suniyoshi. Thank you, everyone. I just want to again say thank you to Senator Riviere for setting this up to my counterparts, Representative Matsumoto and Quinlan, and to Jacob. You do do an amazing job in moderating. And to our presenters, we have online three different directors from um, city departments. I just want to say to have that level of engagement from you um, during this proceeding and having you stay the whole time is, is really remarkable. And I want to thank you for that. And from the state, having the state representative there as well. But um, I just really did want to thank your com the community, everyone who's on now. Uh, many of you have been and continue to be very strong advocates for your community and your advocacy really helps to drive what happens. Um, your advocacy for your community and the way you come out for your community is an inspiration for all of us. And it, it's not going on um, deaf ears. We do know for sure that there's so much that we need to come together and work on together. And by us all coming together here tonight, I do as um, Senator was saying, it's it's a starting point from a lot for a lot, a lot, a lot of things that have to be done. And so um, I think from speaking for myself and to the city um, directors from the various departments who are on board, we're committed to coming together and doing everything we can to address the issues that you've faced and continue to face. Like I said, we do have that joint meeting happening on April 5th to 
further um, consolidate our information about what has happened and where we go moving forward. I know um, the, the bridge issues and the possible bridge closures are still of great concern. I see a lot of continuing concerns about how um, emergency vehicles are going to be able to go over the bridges. So um, I will be discussing with Department of Transportation Services and DDC on that and get a confirmed answer for that um, as far as the emergency vehicles path to get into your areas and send that out to the chat to information to all of you so that you can have confirmed information on that. Um, but like I said, it is an unfolding um, discussion and we will definitely continue to provide updates on that as we go through um, the issues of repairing the bridges. It's much needed work and we will stay concerted and um, focused and diligent on that. But thank you again to all that everybody's on here and we look forward to working together. You guys are all an inspiration to us and thank you. All right, guys, uh, that's going to be a wrap for this town hall, um, but want to thank each and every one of you for joining us. Um, if you want to view this town hall again, uh, it is uh, posted on the Facebook pages of the representatives and senators and council member here. Um, it'll also be made available on YouTube and you should be receiving a follow up um, email um, probably by tomorrow uh, with additional information. Um, but until next time, stay safe. Um, and we hope to see you folks again soon. Aloha.